Hello and welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am super excited about this topic. It is amazing, insightful presentation that we have for you and I'm excited to get started. If I haven't met you before, if this is your first time attending one of our webinars, my name is Caitlin. It's great to meet you. If I've met you in person or you've been watching these for a while, it's good to see you. Welcome back. Today we're talking about sales and use tax from an auditor's perspective. And um, what we have and what we're covering today is really special because our speaker, Mary, is going to be pulling direct insights and best practices from their own personal experiences working with our customers as well as their time as a state auditor with the state of Washington. Now, you all know that before we dive in, I have to cover some of our housekeeping items. I'm going to go ahead and do that now. A warm reminder that Adler cannot provide legal tax advice. We're going to answer your questions as best as we can. Um, we're going to be talking about these topics in depth as best as we can, but this is always a friendly reminder. That safe harbor statement I have up on the screen. Oh, too fast. Safe harbor statement I have up here. Um, you've all seen it before. <laughs> you've been to one of our webinars. So I'm going to leave it up here. Review it if you like. I'm going to continue with some additional housekeeping. We are recording today's webinar, so if you'd like to view it again or share with a colleague, it'll be in your inbox 24 hours from now. The console that you're looking at can be customized, so feel free to move, resize any of those windows. The additional resources section is chock full with a ton of great links and related resources. If there are any you would like to check out, go ahead and click on the now. They'll open up in a new tab and be waiting for you when this console disappears. All right, if you have any questions, go ahead and use that ask a question box. It's gonna be the best way for us to answer your questions. We are gonna have some time at the end of the presentation to answer some questions with our speaker. The button down at the bottom with the chat bubbles is gonna be for our group chat. So this is your way to connect and chat with other customers on the line. Feel free to leave your name, your company, and maybe even where you're tuning in from. So hello from Seattle, Washington and Avalara HQ. The button down um, at the bottom that looks like a question mark is for your technical issues. So if you have any questions, if you're experiencing any of those technical issues, Click that box first, it'll open up a frequently asked page. Um, and so we can try and troubleshoot some of those technical blockers. All right. So um, as you probably know, we are offering one CPE credit for this presentation today. So if you are looking to claim this CPE, cre CPE credit today, uh, we are going to ask you to respond to three of the four poll questions. They are going to display for a limited amount of time. Make sure to keep an eye out um, for those questions so that you can answer them. Um, you must also attend the full duration of the webinar, which is at least 50 minutes. We're going to have some time for Q&A at the end. Once you have met the CPE requirements, so those poll questions and attended that timer, your certificate will be available to download in the Earn Certification box of your screen. Click the icon at the bottom of that box to access your CPE certificate. It'll open up a PDF in a new tab and you can download it from there. Your certificate will also be sent in the post webinar email. So if you don't have a chance to download it um, today, you can also download it when you get the email. Lastly, we also have a survey at the end of the webinar. So when we close this, you'll see a survey pop up. We absolutely appreciate your feedback. We take a look at all of them and it helps us improve the experience for the next webinar. So let us know what you thought. Okay, so now I'm gonna introduce our presenter for today. Really excited to have Mary with us. She joined Avalara back in 2019 and is the tax director for professional services at Avalara. She works with our customers every single day, especially on historical tax obligations, uh, voluntary disclosure agreements, all of the above. 
And before Avalara, Mary actually worked at Grant Thornton, Expedia, PwC, Deloitte, and was an auditor for the state of Washington. So we are really excited to have Mary with us here today. And to kick it off and to really help Mary direct her conversation and her presentation um, towards the best audience, just wanted to put this poll question out. This is the first CPE poll question. So if you go to another tab, come back. <laughs> CPE poll question one, are you a CPA? Yes, you have an active license. Yes, but an inactive license or no. Let us know in that poll question. Um, you only have a limited amount of time to answer that. So please do so. Um, again, this is our first poll question of the day. All right, Mary, I will let you take it from here. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Caitlin, getting myself on move here. So hi, everyone. Welcome to the SalesPath Masterclass webinar. For today's discussion, we will cover the following agenda items. Uh, we're going to talk about Nexus, um, audit triggers, audit best practices, managing sales tax compliance, consequences of non-compliance, and then we'll have some time for Q&A. So let's imagine when you return to the office tomorrow, on your desk is a tax notice from a jurisdiction the company is not currently registered for sales tax. So what is the first thing that comes to mind besides panic, right? So the first thing that should come to mind is whether or not you have Nexus in the state. Does the company have Nexus in the jurisdiction? So what is Nexus? So Nexus is defined as some connection the seller has with a taxing jurisdiction that allows the jurisdiction to require the seller to register and file a tax return. The term connection is what we're going to talk about in the next couple of slides, and it's pretty broadly defined. So here on this slide, there's five different types of nexus. I'm going to go into more detail regarding physical and economic nexus. But from a high level, physical nexus is just what the term implies, that you're physically in the state. For example, we have an employee inventory. It also means temporarily being in the jurisdiction. Um, one of the confusing parts about physical nexus is that a lot of people think that, well, I may have an employee in the state but my revenue didn't exceed the transaction or revenue count, which is economic nexus. So I wanted to kind of dispel that confusion by saying that physical nexus, the instant that you have an employee in the state or trigger any other type of physical nexus, you have a registration and fire requirement. It doesn't matter that you did not breach the revenue or transaction count threshold because that's economic nexus. So each type of these nexuses listed here are analyzed on its own and separately. It's not all meld together. So again, I just want to reemphasize it and I'll reemphasize a lot during this conversation here today is that physical nexus, the instant that you have triggered that you have a filing and uh, reporting obligation, you do not have to meet the threshold, which is then the next um, nexus type, which is economic nexus. And for this, I will also have a slide that will separately go into details here. And then just quickly, this is as a result of the Wayfair case that came about late June of 2018 that does just look at sales and or transaction counts. The next um, little nexus explanation is um, the gray tab, which is uh, click through nexus. Uh, this came about back in 2008. It was a while ago. It was between New York and Amazon. Um, it was when Amazon uh, was paying a certain partners um, a kind of referral or a lead fee to generate uh, leads from that partner website, but then they click that link to the Amazon website. And so if that customer purchased something from Amazon, then Amazon would then compensate that partner for providing that referral or lead. And so New York had then audited and assessed tax on Amazon at, through that click-through nexus. And that um, basically created physical nexus for Amazon. Affiliated Nexus is the next tab over. Um, this one here talks about more or less kind of related entities where one entity has kind of like shared services with another entity, and therefore it draws in usually the parent entity into the jurisdiction and creating physical nexus. 
The last one here is Marketplace Nexus, and this is more uh, related to facilitators that provide a platform for multiple sellers to sell their products on the Marketplace Facilitator uh, website. Um, more, most famous is, of course, Amazon. And so if the Marketplace Facilitator has created physical or economic nexus, then they are obligated to collect a remit tax on behalf of the remote sellers. So one of the things I want to reemphasize, as I explained earlier, each of these nexus types are kind of analyzed on its own. You don't meld them all together. So again, I just want to emphasize with physical nexus, you don't have to exceed the revenue threshold for economic nexus. The instance that you have an employee, you have a registration and fine requirement. So this next slide, um, I want to kind of dive in a little bit uh, deeper into physical nexus. This is kind of a laundry list of all the different triggers for uh, physical nexus. Uh, most of the common, of course, I mentioned earlier, is having employees in the state. Having payroll taxes is a good indicator that you have physical nexus in the state. Um, also having 1099 independent contractors um, or agents providing services on behalf of the seller, that does create physical nexus. A lot of people don't think it does because they're not their, your employees, but um, there's actually a couple of U.S. Supreme Court cases that have said that what they're doing, uh, such as selling, marketing, branding, uh, attending you know, trade shows on your behalf, or even doing installations, warranty work, or training, um, that that's no different than having your employees doing the same. It's just an extension of your employees that does create physical nexus. I mentioned how earlier about affiliate nexus, and that's the same thing too. A lot of times what I see is the international parent that has a U.S. subsidiary. That U.S. subsidiary would provide sales and marketing and customer um, experience and excellence on behalf of the international parent. But the international parent is the one that's actually selling and delivering products into the U.S. And so, unfortunately, that does not shield the parent at, uh, located outside the U.S. from nexus. That does create physical nexus. The next thing I want to talk about is property inventory. Uh, oftentimes, sellers uh, would have inventory sitting in a warehouse, a warehouse that they don't own or operate or rent. Um, it's rented by somebody else. It's usually a three-party logistics company, 3PL, or uh, the, the individuals working in those warehouses are not their employees. But it doesn't matter, right, because you have inventory that you own sitting on a pallet somewhere in a location. And so that does create physical nexus. A common uh, area about property is Amazon, fulfillment by Amazon, FBA. Uh, a lot of people don't know that uh, through that type of arrangement with Amazon, that does create physical nexus. So you have your inventory sitting at an Amazon warehouse. What makes it really challenging is that Amazon is known to rotate that inventory from warehouse to warehouse, as well as across state lines. So at any given point in time, you may have nexus in almost all states that have a sales tax regime, unfortunately. Usually when I bring this up with customers, the first thing they say to me is, well, Mary, Amazon collects tax on my behalf, so why should I worry about sales tax? Well, that's where the confusion starts, right? So having inventory that creates physical nexus. So that's one instance. The other analysis is that if you have physical nexus, the question is, based on what you're selling or who you're selling to, is that subject to tax? Right. And so, yes, you may have sales through Amazon. So Amazon collects tax. You're not taxed again. You may also sell through distributors or resellers. And as long as you have a valid exempt certificate, then you're not taxed on those transactions. But what the states want is when you're selling on your e-commerce website direct to consumers and you're not collecting tax because you trigger physical nexus through FBA. That's what the states are looking for is the uncollected tax on that portion. So I hope that makes sense. All right, so the next slide here, we're going to switch gears and talk about economic nexus. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this came about in a U.S. Supreme Court case with uh, Wayfair in South Dakota, where South Dakota sued Wayfair, which is the um, popular on online retailer of home furnishings and furniture. And uh, because Wayfair did not have physical nexus. Um, and with South Dakota, they argued that they were losing a lot of revenue. And so at the end of the day, the courts had agreed that through the advancement of the internet and technology, that you don't really need physical nexus to, um, to trigger uh, reporting and, and sales tax uh, collection to the state. One of the confusion here is that economic nexus did not replace physical nexus, right? It just, physical nexus still exists today. 
With the second bullet point there, what it's saying is that Wayfair overruled prior nexus standards that said physical nexus was the only nexus trigger. It's no longer the only nexus trigger. So there's both physical and economic nexus. With economic nexus, it looks at the economic activity in the state at a given point in time, the evaluation period. The, way, the evaluation period, um, you kind of look at it as kind of like the look back period. So you look back to the prior period to see if your revenue and or transaction count breached the threshold. Um, the look back period doesn't mean that you owe tax during the evaluation period. It just means that is what you use to determine if you've reached the threshold. To add some more complexity to that, then if the threshold is breached during the evaluation period, then you've uh, triggered economic nexus as of or after the enforcement date. The enforcement date is basically when the law went into effect, right? So you wouldn't have economic nexus as a physical nexus prior to the enforcement date. So this um, is a slide with a map. Um, there are 46 states in the US have a sales tax regime. Those in white do not have a sales tax um, in their state. Um, so all 46 states do have economic nexus laws. Um, Missouri is the last state to um, go into effect, which is January of 2000. 23, which is in a few couple months here. Um, Connecticut and New York have an and test where they do require revenue and transaction count to have breached the thresholds. The remaining states, some of the challenges, as you can see here with all the colors, that is the threshold varies from state to state. Um, and it's usually uh, transaction count and or um, the revenue threshold. Another challenge with economic nexus is that trying to keep track of which state, you know, what is included or what's excluded in the threshold, such as taxable transactions, or is that included, or exempt transactions, uh, non-taxable services, or even sales made in the marketplace, are those included or excluded from the threshold? To give you some flavor in terms of the disparity is that I'm in Washington State with Caitlin, and Washington looks at gross revenue to determine if you exceeded the $100,000. Gross revenue means whether it's tax or non taxable whether it's professional services, whether it's sales to the marketplace, whether it's sales through distributors, resellers, or exempt. Those are all included in the $100,000 threshold for economic nexus. That does not necessarily mean that that revenue is subject to tax. Again, we're just trying to figure out if you're subject to uh, nexus triggering activities here for economic nexus. The other extreme here is Florida. They look at only taxable tangible personal property. So if you're selling to an exempt uh, certificate in terms of um, a federal government or they're for resale or you're selling services that are not taxable, it's not included in the $100,000 threshold for Florida. So I just want to recap, just to make sure it's clear that, you know, with Nexus, in terms of the threshold, uh, just because you're including gross revenue, it does not mean you're taxed on those gross revenue. It's just used to determine if you breach the threshold for the revenue and or transaction count. Then the next question is, once you breach the economic Nexus, is determined if based on what you're selling or who you're selling to, is that subject to tax? So let's confirm your understanding by asking some situational questions. The first question here is company A sells furniture. They have a California employee since 2014. In 2021, California's gross revenue is $275,000. The economic nexus threshold in California is a half a million dollars of gross sales of tangible personal property. So the question here is, did company A trigger California nexus? So if you answered yes, uh, then you had done that correctly because company A had an employee, right? As I've mentioned several times, you had physical nexus. So the instant you hire that employee in 2014, you have a registration and flying requirement, regardless of whether or not you have reached or exceeded the economic nexus threshold. Because again, those are two different analysis, economic versus physical nexus. Next question, company B licensed software. Software is not taxable in California. They have a California employee since 2014. Their 2021 California gross revenue is $400,000. And again, the threshold in California is a half a million dollars of gross sales of TPP. Did company B trigger California nexus? 
again, if you answered yes, then you got it correct. Company B, again, triggered physical nexus. They had an employee there in 2014. The tricky part here is that company B selling software is not subject to tax. And so they'll be filing a zero tax due return because software is not taxable in the, in the state of California. So from a practical standpoint, I often get asked, well, why should I file a zero return? Um, uh, definitely, you know, legally, because you have Nexus, you are required to register and file, but you'll be filing a zero return. But from a practical standpoint, I would say I have a lot of customers that decide not to file zero returns. The downside of not registering um, is that, of course, um, and I'll talk about this in, in a bit in a future slides, is that states will do a comparison check, information sharing, that they find out you're paying you know, payroll taxes, L&I in the state, labor and industries, but you're not filing sales and use tax returns, so they'll send you an inquiry letter. You might perform like, you know, an audit of your books and records to see if you're really selling, you know, software, if it's tax or exempt. Um, and, and at the end of the day, there may not be any tax interest from penalties. There might be some filing fees for late, late filing fees. Um, also, another downside of not registering is that there's a tax law change. Uh, Maryland is the most recent state, I believe, that I'm aware of that they had a uh, fast uh, tax law change where before prior to March of 2021, they did not tax digital content. And um, as of March, they, uh, they now tax SAS. And so if you're never registered in the state, you're not running your transactions through Avatax, it will never add tax to those transactions. And lastly, um, if you're never registered in the state, the statute of limitations does not apply. Um, so basically you're not compliant, right? So then the state can go back indefinitely to you know, audit your books and records to determine whether or not there's any tax placement. Last question here, um, company C sells toys. They have no California employee. In 2021, the California gross revenue is 650,000. 400 of that is taxable. 250 of that is to exempt customers. Economic Nexus, as I mentioned before, is half a million dollars. So the question is, did company C trigger California Nexus? And again, if you answered yes, you got that right. So company C does because they have breached the economic nexus threshold um, due to gross sales exceeding half a million dollars, right? Because they had 650,000 of gross revenue. Um, so once you've exceeded the half a million dollar mark, then you analyze your transactions, to determine if it's tax or exempt, right? So I'll, I'll continue to mention this throughout this presentation. So the first analysis is, do you have nexus? If you have Nexus, then you decide whether or not your transactions are tax or exempt. So here they had trigger Nexus. And so you need then after the Nexus breach, you need to determine the taxability of those transactions. Caitlin. That's right. It's time for a CPE poll question. So uh, Mary, thank you so much. I love the quiz format. I love, I think this group loves getting tested, see what they know. We are going to do our next CPE poll questions. So if you've gone other ways, come on back. Question is, has your company been audited for sales tax compliance within the last five years? Yes, I met with the auditors. Yes, but was before my time or with a different team? No or not sure. So go ahead and let us know in the CPE poll question. Great question, um, Caitlin. So audit triggers. So where are you leaving a footprint for the tax authorities to come find you? So here are some of some of my experience when I was in public accounting uh, based on just talking to customers who were flagged for audits out of curiosity. I would just ask the auditors, well, how did you discover my client was you know, doing business in your state? So here's just a laundry list. Um, just out of ordinary tax discovery in terms of the fact that you uh, triggered nexus, you have physical nexus in the state or economic nexus, that they will send you a nexus questionnaire. Um, those nexus questionnaires are pretty gnarly. They're about four to six pages long. It's just very nosy in terms of what they want you, you know, fill out as to what you're selling, how you're selling it, 
you know, who are you selling it to, um, what your revenues are. Um, basically, they're open-ended questions, leading questions. Uh, depending on how you're answering those questions, may end up turning into an audit, um, unfortunately. And so, so that's what a Nexus questionnaire is. The next bullet point, I kind of hinted to this, is that if you're filing payroll taxes, um, there is information sharing uh, within the state as well as with outside the state, outside the state between the jurisdictions, is that they'll do a really quick high level comparison check that if you're paying payroll taxes, again, instant physical nexus, why are you not filing a sales and use tax return? So they'll reach out to you to inquire about that. The third bullet point here is what they call trickle down referrals. So, you know, what you're selling, who you're selling to, if it's B2B, most commonly, you're selling to a business, who are your buyers? Well, those businesses get audited. And so when you get audited, they look at two things based on what you're selling as well as what you're buying. So for use tax on your purchases. And so when they go through your invoices, they found out that you bought, you know, a couple of computers that are being used in the office, but there was no sales talks on there. You know, with the camera phones nowadays, they'll take a picture of the invoice, go back to the office, send you a little inquiry letter, um, turn it into an audit. So again, that's how you kind of do this tax discovery is that your customers, your buyers are the ones getting audited. Public information, big thing here. It's and most uh, importantly, it's free, right? So internet, right? You go in there, you type in, you know, I, I want to buy a dress, you want to buy some sandals, or you want to buy some supplements or whatnot. You have all the remote sellers listed that come on your search engine. And so that's what the state department revenue look at as well in, in order to send out campaign letters. Trade shows. Uh, this is a real big one for states. Um, they'll go into the convention centers or trade centers. And a lot of times they have these events tabs, right? You go click on the events, it shows all the different trade shows that are coming into town. And if you click into that, they'll, they'll show you who all the sponsors are, who are all the attendees in, and having the booths set up. And again, states will then take that list and compare it to their registration portal. And if you're not registered for sales tax, they'll send you an inquiry letter. I had a um, customer that was located outside the U.S. Um, years ago, and they were contacted for audit. And uh, in doing kind of my due diligence, I asked my client, I go, have, do, you know, what kind of activity do you have in the state? And they go, oh, none at all. We've never set foot into the state. Uh, we are just here, you know, in the U.K. And so when I called the auditor, the auditor was nice enough to lead me to their website. And with every website, you go down to the very bottom where they have all the terms and conditions and all the links about the information about the company. And there was a link that said events. And so I clicked on the events and sure enough, they were in the state about a couple times a year for the last six years. So you can't argue that it was on the taxpayer's website. Um, also on websites, there's all usually links if you want to become a partner or influencer, right? You want to earn a couple of bucks by, again, click through next, as I mentioned, by providing leads or referrals to the remote seller. They'll compensate you, give you 10 bucks, 50 bucks or whatnot. That creates physical nexus. So again, all that kind of information is on the website of an internet and it's all free. Marketplace. Um, unfortunately, a lot of these marketplace facilitators, they do list out who all their remote sellers are. And again, um, it's not unusual for the taxing department to go through that and again, comparing it to those, uh, those customers who are registered and not and sending out um, tax discovery letters. The next slide here, um, this is kind of an unofficial list. I didn't really do anything formal except for just based on my experience um, in my past in providing consulting services, um, as well as my experience here with Avalara. I've kind of, I think I've logged in about almost 3,000 customer calls since I've been here at Avalara. But these are the most aggressive states in, in just talking to customers that, that received either inquiry letters or audits um, and discovering that they were unregistered when they should be. And so here we have California, Florida, Illinois, New Jersey, New York, PA, Texas, Washington, and Wisconsin. Um, those with asterisks, I would say on my top five list. Uh, you might think, well, Wisconsin, I just kind of sticks out, right? And not to put anything down on Wisconsin, but boy, I would say Wisconsin is on my top three list in terms of 
um, listing some customers uh, being contacted by the state for uh, you know tax discovery or audits. Super super aggressive. So. So next thing we're going to talk about is audit best practices. So I have some audit tips to kind of make your audit experience uh, a, a, bit, a bit easier. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any tricks to make your audit go away, but hopefully from this laundry list is just kind of what I used when I was in consulting, um, not to be confused confused as to what I'm doing here at Avalara. I do not provide audit support, but hopefully this will help you in your uh, audit situation. So the first thing is um, having a notification that you're being audited. Usually it is a letter. Uh, when I am on calls here at Avalara with customers, I just, uh, I know my eyes just roll back when I have customers say, well, I, yeah, I received a letter. And then my first question is, well, how long ago was it? And they'll say, oh, it was six months ago. And, oh yeah, I think I got another letter um, last month and it's just sitting on their desk and they're not responding to it. So please, please, please do not ignore tax notices. Uh, back in public accounting, I had a customer where uh, the controller didn't respond to any notice of audit. Um, and so the state issued a jeopardy assessment, which is an estimate of taxes due. And as you can imagine, they estimate on the high side with tax interest and penalties. Uh, the uh, taxpayer, the controller ignored that um, and went into collections. Um, they ignored that. And then um, the controller left. The vice president went to process payroll one day. And guess what? There was no money in the bank account. Um, and so what happened was the taxing authorities had filed a warrant, a lien against their assets, and those assets was their bank account. So they withdrew uh, over $800,000, $800,000 from a bank account. Uh, they hired me to go to the state and clean it up. It took me almost a year to clean that up. And yes, during that year, the state had their $800,000 and plus the bill that I had charged them for to help them kind of unwind all of this. Um, at the end of the day, they owed about, I think, $150,000, but 75% of that was penalties because uh, that was accumulated because of the lack of response from the taxpayer. So please do not ignore tax notices. Usually those tax notices do have like an expiration date that ex they expect you to respond by. Um, if you can't for some reason, you're on vacation or whatnot, please pick up the phone or email them and ask for an extension and certainly get it in writing. So that way when you do get back, um, you, you can respond timely on that. Um, the next thing I mentioned earlier, and I'll continue to mention this, is that statute of limitations does not apply if you've never registered. So I oftentimes have customers say, oh, well, I'll, I, you know, I won't worry about that because, you know, uh, the earlier years will roll off. I go, oh, well, it's not going to roll off because if you don't come forward with clean hands, neither is the state. So they're going to go back indefinitely to when Nexus is triggered. Um, books and records, um, the lack of. Interesting enough, I've had customers tell me, well, you know, the earlier years we were a startup company or we were a different ERP system. And so we don't have, you know, accurate books and records. And so uh, that's good for us because there's no basis for the taxing authorities to assess taxes on us, right? No. Uh, as I mentioned, jeopardy assessments. Uh, taxpayers have the responsibility to keep accurate books and records. The lack of the taxing authorities will estimate the amount of taxes due. Um, and as I mentioned before, they will estimate on the high side with interest and penalties. And they will put you on the defense to show that that's not what you owe. And because you don't have books and records, you can't prove that it should be something else. So, so you do please keep accurate books and records. Scheduling kickoff calls. So you're going down the audit path um, and they'll usually have a list of books and records they want you to provide and the time period. Before you start pulling all that information, I definitely would uh, recommend scheduling a kickoff call to get a better understanding. Do you really need five years worth of bank statements or can I just provide you with the last three months? And if you're comfortable with that, then we just call it good or do you really need five years worth? So get those kind of things confirmed. 
Um, the other thing too during that kickoff call is to make sure the auditor understands your business, meaning that you think that you're selling consulting services and information, that you're selling information, but the auditor thinks that you're selling software, right? There's a huge disconnect there because the taxability is different for those different revenue streams. So make sure the, rev the uh, revenue agent, the auditor has a real good understanding of what it is you're selling. Also, the next thing is making sure that the auditor uh, understands what you're doing in that jurisdiction. I've had so many clients that go off on saying, oh, yeah, we're a manufacturer. We sell this. We design that. We do installation. We do repair, warranty work, and customer service. But in reality, all they're doing in that jurisdiction is um, customer service. They don't, they're not a manufacturer in the state. The manufacturing happens in another jurisdiction um, and, or it happens to another entity. So those are the kind of things that you want to kind of constrain to that jurisdiction to make sure the facts are correct. The next thing is being respectful, right? Uh, meaning being friendly, but not, you know, just you don't need to be your friend. Um, a lot of the decisions made by the auditor are based on their discretion. And so going back to the uh, um, comment about bank statements, if you're going to be appealed to the auditor, oh, yeah, they're going to ask you for five years worth of bank statements. Um, or if you do get along with them and you have a good rapport, then, yeah, if they're comfortable uh, with the information, they're just not going to ask for all that information. So, again, just be respectful. Um, you don't need to be rude um, to the auditor. They're just doing their job. The manage the audit and auditor. Uh, this is the easier said than done. Um, as taxpayers, you do have certain uh, rights. Um, you don't need to be a pushover, uh, but definitely if an auditor does, you know, make a statement that they think that this is taxable, feel free to ask them for citations, court cases, or justifications for their decisions to support their position um, and, and just, you know, work with them on that. But again, you just don't need to be a pushover and take it as uh, what they're asking for. On a need to know basis, and this is where I come from my experience as an auditor, I've seen so many instances where um, taxpayers, they just they just love to talk about their situation um, and they will talk about how the parent corporation that is in the Netherlands, well, the CFO came into town last week and took them all out to lunch and or that the CFO just recently bought a yacht that's sitting in Oregon, but he comes over to Seafair in Washington. So those are the kind of things that is kind of like just keep it to exactly what the otter is looking for. Uh, don't volunteer information, let them do their job. If they ask the question, answer it, but you don't need to uh, volunteer those information, especially affiliated entities, um, because what's going to happen is they're going to end up auditing all the related entities to make sure whether or not, number one, if you guys have created Nexus, and number two, whether or not there's taxes due. On the other side here is getting um, everything in writing um, and over communicated, right? So, so this kind of goes in line with tracking deadlines. Um, if you have, if the auditor does provide you with a deadline, certainly if you're not able to meet that, ask for an extension. Um, certainly, if the eighth time that you've asked for an extension, uh, I think the auditor is going to be pretty frustrated and kind of understands that you're kind of kicking the can down the road. And so they're going to put kind of a, um, you know, a finality into that audit and say that it's going to be turned in. And then if you're still gathering certificates, well, you can do that after the audit's been complete and you can ask for a refund back. So again, get everything in writing, make sure there's no misunderstanding. Complete the audit as soon as possible. And what this is, is that I, I don't like auditors lingering around because then they start thinking about things, you know, and they kind of over process information. So I try to get them everything they want, answer the questions as soon as possible, get it closed out as soon as possible. Um, I remember um, dealing with a contractor and the auditor wanted all this information and each file was like four, six inches thick. And so what I did was I painstakingly post a note every single tab that she was asking for, you know, invoices, contracts, because I didn't want her going through the whole, you know, file because she might find something, right, or something. And so I just wanted her to just focus on what she was asking for and, and, and she was in and out of there. Audit findings and draft schedules. So once the auditor is done with their fact gathering and reconciliation, um, they will provide you, hopefully, with draft schedules. So that way you have a chance to then look over them and provide uh, 
you know, a reasoning or explanation for the differences, provide invoices or provide exam certificates to reduce the assessment. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, it could be that you agree to disagree and then there's the appeal process. Uh, with the appeal process, uh, certainly, you know, realize what's your defense. Is it because it's so much money or you just didn't know or it's not fair? Uh, because you got to realize, uh, you know, what's the success rate in using that as a defense? Because it does cost time and money to file an appeal. Uh, usually with appeals that are successful is where it's uh, a position you're taking with a matter of law or a matter of fact, meaning that there's a disagreement as to what is you're selling. Factually, um, again, going back to the example, you think you're selling consulting services or information, but the auditor thinks that you're selling software um, or that there is a misinterpretation of the law. That's where appeal would come into play. Nothing is final. So you think the auditor comes in and says, you know what, great news, there's no adjustment, everything looks great. So you're thinking, oh, finally, it's all done. Well, it's not done. What's going to happen is that the auditor is going to prepare the report, go send it to the, her supervisor or his supervisor. The supervisor is going to come back and say, you know what, I don't think that's consulting service. I really think that's software. And so they're going to come back and make that adjustment. And now all of a sudden you have an assessment. So nothing is really final. Um, likewise, I've had situations where we had filed a use tax refund uh, that was overpaid. The state agreed, um, issued a check uh, for six figures. And a year and a half later, the state came back and said, we changed our mind. We made a mistake. We want the money back. Uh, and yes, they can do that because it's within the statute of limitations. Likewise, if you got audited and you didn't have exempt certificates and you later on, six months later or whatnot, within the statute of limitations, you come across a, a exempt certificate, you can go back to the auditor and ask for a refund on that. Lastly, um, I get asked this quite a bit when I was in consulting is that should I go out alone, do the audit by myself, or should I hire a tax? you know, advisor to help me. Um, I, I, to me, it just depends on your comfort level, right? Um, and if you've done it before, uh, but certainly hiring a tax advisor is not cheap. Um, and so also too, if you're doing it alone and then you find out you're going down the rabbit hole and you hire a tax expert, well, that tax expert has to then re, you know, reassess what has been said and done and damage control. And that would cost even more than it was if you had just hired the tax expert from the beginning. So it's, again, it's just, you know, it's, it's more of a case by case basis, I would say. So here in the next couple of slides, I'm going to talk about three areas of common and high recovery um, and source of revenue to the state due to tax audits. And so a common theme here for this discussion today is tax discovery, finding out taxpayers that have not been registered and remitting tax. And so now they're um, being audited. And so it's not just the tax, right? It's tax, interest, and penalties going back to um, when nexus was triggered, or usually some states have some kind of a limit, usually like six or eight years, but it's more of a state-by-state -state basis. The other area of a common recovery is uh, taxability of products and services. There's a misunderstanding. You thought that software was not taxable in the state. Um, most states do um, tax software. I think, not most, but I would say half. California doesn't tax digital content. Washington does. And so a lot of people think that, well, they don't tax in California. I just assume that Washington doesn't. Well, that's incorrect. Tax law changes, that's a common thing too. Um, you know, instead of raising tax rates, they change the taxability of products uh, from non-taxable to now taxable. And as I mentioned earlier with Maryland, they changed the laws um, March of 2021, where now digital content is now taxable. Uh, but usually some customers are not aware of that, and so they're not registered. And so for the, that liability um, perpetuates and then continues. Uh, really important here, sellers are liable for the uncollected tax. And then if you're audited, you also owe interest and penalties, right? Um, and I know it, it's going to hard to swallow because well, you didn't collect it. But thing is, you should have collected because you had trigger nexus, whether it be physical or economic. And then lastly on this slide, if you did collect tax, 
But I had customers that say, you know what, I can't afford a tax engine. I can't afford, you know, automating a software. I'm just going to use one common rate. Well, you know what? If you under collected the tax, you're still liable for um, the difference there, the underreporting, even though you were registered, you, you're not collecting the right amount of tax. This slide here talks about exempt certificates. Um, this is a, is a real deal killer here in terms of audit assessments. Um, I call this uh, death by documentation or death by the lack of documentation. And it could be because you just I had a customer this morning that said, what is an exempt certificate? And it was like, oh my gosh. Um, an exempt certificate is to show that your buyer, that they are reselling the product or that they themselves are exempt because they're a 501c3 in certain states or they're federal government or they're a, um, you know, a entity that is exempt in the state or they're providing manufacturing R&D or whatnot. And so those are the certificates that your buyer would provide you so that way you're not liable for the sales tax. Oftentimes, when you do get collect those certificates, the names don't match, the data of the invoice don't match the data of the exempt certificate, or the signature is incorrect, meaning that there's certain states that need an officer to sign, but instead the office manager signed it. So these are all the different nuances that the auditor is trying to get you, so that way they can deny the exempt certificate and assess tax on the seller. So it's very, very important to make sure you have these exempt certificates and they're valid. Um, you're probably thinking, you know, common sense. Well, I had situations where I had clients, uh, it's a big box retailer, they sold pallets of toilet paper every couple of weeks, and guy who, who would consume that in a given week or two weeks, right? It was common sense who they're, you know, selling to that it's for resale, but they didn't collect a certificate, and guess what? The auditor assessed tax until they got the certificate from their customer. So best practice is collect certificates valid certificates from your customers who are claiming they're exempt, even though you may not be registered in the state because you never know when the states come knocking in your door and saying, hey, you triggered Nexus and now you're supposed to register. So at least you have those certificates in file. Last thing here is consumer use tax. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, when you get audited, they look at two things, what you're selling and what you're buying. So if you're buying uh, property or uh, services that are taxable and the seller has not collected tax, you are responsible for the use tax on this situation. So just when you thought you got a, such a great deal on purchasing that capital equipment with this, without sales tax, well, guess what? You're gonna be dinged for the use tax with just not just tax, but interest and penalties. Um, there are several reasons why the seller may not have charged sales tax because, you know, obviously they may not have nexus in the state um, or unfortunately they did not know what they are selling to you, like software was subject to tax in that state. Um, so at the end of the day, you are responsible for self-assessing self the use tax on those purchases. Caitlin, I think we have another polling question. That we do. Thank you, Mary. I could listen to your stories all day. You're such a good storyteller. And I think you have so many experiences and, and customer stories. It's like story time. Love it. All right, CPE poll question number three. What is the most challenging for you and your company? Internal resources, staffing, expertise, complexity of business, changing regulations, or managing tech and tools. All right, let's uh, talk about managing sales tax compliance. So where do you start, right? So it's so confusing. There's so much to take track of. So um, unfortunately, based on my experience, sales tax is an afterthought with most companies. They're most focused on the federal side and state income tax. Um, so it's kind of a constant working process in educating taxpayers. So. Unfortunately, in the U.S., every state is kind of like their own country with their own tax laws and tax rates. So it's always constantly challenging um, in keeping track of all of that. So where do we start? So here, um, this slide, um, you know, there's different uh, stages here, um, the journey of sales tax compliance. Uh, I'm only going to focus on the first one because, as I mentioned, the very early part of this presentation is Nexus. Nexus is a foundation for all things tax. 
So if you as a seller do not have nexus in that jurisdiction, a connection, then you don't have a registration and seller requirement in that state. But the thing is, how do you know whether or not you have nexus in the state? Um, and if you do have nexus, uh, when did that occur and how much tax do you owe, right? So that's the question. And lucky for you, we have a solution, which is a nexus study. Uh, we do offer here at Avalara a sales tax risk assessment. Uh, and what that is, is here it kind of lays out the work plan. Uh, the first thing is that we gather information and data from you. And so the information is that we have a series of questions. We ask your physical location, trade shows, your employee activities, third party activities, as I mentioned earlier, 1099s, uh, where you have property, if, you know, franchises, and how the property is being distributed. Uh, we also get an upload of your data, usually um, five years uh, worth of data if you have that. Uh, of course, if your company didn't exist five years ago, we'll get whatever you have. Um, and you, we use that data to analyze economic nexus. So once we have that, we try to, you know, we identify if and when nexus was triggered. And then we quantify the exposure with interest and penalties based on kind of the best case and worst case scenarios. So worst case, if the state contacted you today, uh, what, would, what would the tax interest and penalties be? Uh, whereas if you did the next step, which is a voluntary disclosure, what would the benefits be in that situation? With the voluntary disclosure, um, you qualify up for that. Every state has a version of a voluntary disclosure agreement, and that's where you come forward, you raise your hand, and say, "Hey, you know, uh, we have triggered nexus in the prior periods. We're willing to come forward to remit that tax to be fully compliant." And as a result, the states would waive penalties. Penalties do range from 10 to 50 percent. Uh, there's only a few states that will waive interest, but most of them will not, unfortunately. And then also uh, the statute limitations will apply to basically less than the um, look back period, um, again, depending on when the next was triggered. So we looked at whether or not a voluntary disclosure makes sense. But if Nexus was just recently triggered within, like, let's say, 60, 90 days, then maybe it makes sense to register in the state and then just be compliant going forward. Um, and then um, I always mention the states, even, uh, not states, but our clients. Um, so we identify Nexus, and let's say it was 15. Then how about the remaining states that Nexus wasn't triggered? Let's make sure that you have a plan going forward to monitor those states to make sure you're not in the same situation you were behind and now you're liable for the uncollected tax. So, so, so again, there's 46 states in the U.S. that have a sales tax. Make sure that you have them in buckets of I'm registered, should be registered, but I'm not. So let's take a look at whether or not we have Nexus. And then, then we have the third bucket where it's like you don't have Nexus at all. So let's just monitor those going forward. All right, consequences of non-compliance. So what happens when you do nothing? Um, status quo. Or it's not a priority right now. You're busy doing something else. Or you're going to revisit this next quarter or maybe the next year. So what happens, right? What's the worst that can happen? So I mentioned several times today, statute of limitations does not apply. Um, and so they can go back indefinitely and that liability will continue to accrue, which is then on the right side, sales tax, interest and penalties. Um, and so that is not gonna go away. It's gonna continue to roll forward. Because you're not compliant, you're just inviting sales tax audits. Um, and I have heard that, you know, there is information sharing agreements. And so, um, it's just a matter of time, perhaps, uh, depending, again, your activities in the jurisdiction that the states may contact you for audit, uh, question, a nexus questionnaire, as I mentioned earlier. If you have an internal auditors uh, reviewing your financials, um, they may want you to book an accrual um, on your balance sheet for these contingencies, which is the ASC 450. Um, usually when I was in accounting, public accounting, they called it kind of like a black eye because it doesn't look good, right? Because you're not, um, you're not compliant. Um, so they want to book an accrual to protect the interest of the um, owners, the investors, the board, our shareholders, which is then the box underneath that. And so those are the external factors you need to also consider uh, that the, they are the ones that want to make sure that their investments are protected. Responsible person doctrine, um, the rules. Um, this is actually a very interesting one. Um, this, you know, years ago, People thought, oh, you know, I'm protected by or shielded by the corporation, 
They can't come after me personally for the tax. They got really smart on that because companies were had, you know, companies would have a lot of liability and then they would shut it down and then create another entity. And then they thought, you know, life is good. Well, they, of course, obviously don't like that. And it's not good tax planning. And so what they have is a lot of states have this responsible person doctrine where they will go after the individuals uh, personally for the either uncollected tax or tax that was collected or and not remitted. Uh, and this is a really important thing and it's serious. Uh, there's actually an article in the Journal of Accountancy that is a focus on responsible persons. Um, I actually had clients um, located outside the U.S. He was in his job for like three months. Um, he was a VP of finance. And he told us that the company had collected tax in three states since 2019. And I said, you know, you know um, I don't know how else to say this to you, but that's considered tax fraud. Then you collected tax for that long and not remitted. And he, and he came back and goes, well, I goes, I'm not going to be in trouble for that. I just started here. It wasn't my fault. And I said, well, you know, I go, you may want to look at the tax laws in those jurisdictions regarding the, pers the responsible person doctrine, uh, because they may come after you personally for that uh, uncollected or collected tax that was not remitted. And so he was actually concerned. Um, he wanted to know if he should hire an attorney. He should, you know, should he be like thinking things through? And he just uh, wanted certainly to have a future discussion with the CFO, CEO, and the president. And so we scheduled another call the following week. Uh, but guess who was noticeably absent from that call? The vice president of finance, he had quit. Um, and so this is serious. I think you need to understand that, you know, states are getting smarter in terms of um, companies that have this outstanding debt that um, it just doesn't go away because you dissolve the company. They can go after uh, certain individuals. And these individuals are not just owners or uh, executives. Uh, it could be, that's why I call this responsible person. It depends on the responsibility of this individual. It could, you know, if you're preparing the returns or you're following returns, it could be an office manager. So these are the kind of things you need to look into. And, and so again, it's, it's state by state, you need to look into those rules. And lastly here is due diligence. Um, I see a lot of this now. Uh, I would say a third of my calls are companies that are looking to either get acquired uh, or selling the company in the near term or in the process of going through an acquisition or they're after the acquisition. Um, and so again, with the due diligence, they are gonna look for any uh, non-conforming situations that could be a huge um, liability to the buyer. And of course, sales tax come into play here. And so. So, um, uh, especially with customers who are looking to retire, they built this huge company and they want to sell it. Um, they want to make sure that they're clean and not having to deal with this during a due diligence. I had a customer um, that came to us and um, he said, you know what, three years ago, I looked into this and he was not located in the US. And he was like, I looked into this three years ago when I joined the company and my competitors weren't charging tax and, you know, my one of our colleagues didn't know anything about U.S. sales tax, and everyone I talked to um, basically, you know, was the, you know didn't care much about sales tax, so he just kind of blew it away. And then the company was acquired um, earlier this year uh, through a private equity company. And um, of course, I asked him what happened there because you know usually they hold some funds in um, in an escrow for the seller to correct their um, exposure. In this case, they actually had uh, removed like $5 million from the purchase price. Um, so you can imagine the look in his face and uh, some of the remorse he had. And he goes, if I would have known, but then I didn't say this to him, but I thought, well, when have you relied on your competitors as a source of truth as your tax you know, as to whether or not you have any tax obligations. So, so again, just kind of make sure you have the right uh, resources and expertise to guide you through sales tax uh, and that you're not put off guard. So, um, so this whole discussion is hopefully useful. Um, we're looking to limit and manage your sales tax risk. Um, in conclusion, tax is complicated, as you can imagine, and it's always changing and it's constantly evolving. Um, so hopefully um, you can partner with um, a 
a service provider like Avalara to outsource your sales tax compliance. Caitlin, back to you. Mary, thank you so much. That was a great presentation, a lot of information. We really do appreciate it. We have our last CPE poll question up on the screen here. Now, this one is um, a bit of a left field from the presentation. We are back to in-person events. You might have seen um, our promo reel. What type of events do you plan to attend in 2023? What's your comfort level? What would you like to see events-wise in 2023? All of our options are there. We've got hands-on trainings, thought leadership, trade show conferences, smaller in-person meetings, virtual webinars. Not sure. The ecosystem has changed so much and people's comfort level has changed so much. So let us know. This is the last CPU poll question for today. Mary, we're going to enter in a few questions now. Um, and one that we get all the time, and I see it here too, is what are, in your perspective, the busy seasons for audits? You find that they're more at the top of the year, the end of the year, um, all throughout the year. What are your thoughts there? I haven't really seen it become a seasonal thing. Um, definitely with the budgets, uh, with the tax uh, in the states, you know, if they have, um, there's a huge deficit in terms of revenue that definitely you see a lot more um, audits in, underway, um, especially with uh, post COVID, because during the COVID times, a lot of the states were not operating or they were you know, working remotely. And so, but yeah, definitely we've seen nowadays in terms of not so much the calendar year, but we've seen a lot more uptick in states kind of recovering from COVID and now getting their um, auditors and tax discovery units um, up and running. Thanks, Mary. And I want to clarify one thing. Can you clarify where what Avalara's role is when it comes to audit? So you mentioned you can bring in a tax expert. You can be proactive. You can do these nexus studies, really understand where your footprint is. Um, but we get this question a lot, too, is how can we hire Avalara to help with our audits? And I want to clarify this specifically, Avalara's role. A lot of people hire, a lot of our customers hire outside and they bring in outside experts to help with their audits. Um, but can you maybe clarify this and exactly what Avalara's role is when it comes to audits? Um, our team here with um, the voluntary compliance services team, we don't, as I mentioned earlier, I, we're, I'm, not, I'm no longer in the audit um, um, consulting Space. Um, and so we may have our research team that could help with audits. Um, but I think that it just it's more of a depending on the case of what the situation is. Um, but um, yeah, I think that's something that we could certainly look into further. Awesome. Thank you, Mary. We are running out of time. So I am just going to do some warm reminders about CPE certificate. If you've attended the full duration at this point, that CPE certificate should be available for download. You just need to click the icon. If you're not able to claim it here today, right now, you gotta jump. It'll also be available in the follow-up email as well. Some upcoming webinars and events. We are virtual for the rest of the year, but keep an ear out, keep an eye out. We are back to live events in 2023. We'd love to meet you in person. Um, for, for the rest of the year, we have a virtual calendar. So here's what's left. I believe that one is also offering CPE credit as well. So one more opportunity for the rest of the month. With that, I just want to say a huge thank you to Mary. Uh, Mary, thank you so much for your time, for your expertise, for your stories. That was a really, really strong, a really, really amazing presentation. Mary, thanks for joining us. You bet. Thanks for All having right. me. All right, everybody. We'll see you next time. Have a great day.